to, to see that God can use all these different things in, in a good way. Uh, we, we looked at Satan's devices. God says we're not, to be, we're not ignorant of his devices. We don't have to be fooled by him. Uh, dealing with criticism. Of course, none of you've, you've probably none of you have ever experienced that, so you didn't need that chapter. But, uh, you know, it's going to happen, isn't it? We need to know how to deal with it in a, in a godly way. Paul certainly experienced it. You know, if, you're, if you uh, are a leader, man, there's plenty of people going to criticize you. Uh, not quitting, you know, in chapter 4, he said, faint not. And, uh, you know, the temptation is there many times, isn't it, to just throw up our hands and, and give up. But God says, uh, don't quit. And we, he gives us strength to go on. He talked about holiness or separation, you know, living for the Lord. Uh, how, to, how to disagree with people. <laughs> that was a good chapter. Giving, we looked at some things on, on finances. And then in chapters 10 through 13, uh, we see Paul defending his apostleship. Uh, we started that last week, and you know, it's important to understand this. You, you might think, uh, you know, Paul's just defending himself, but it, it wasn't personal with him. Uh, he didn't care about it personally, uh, but it was, it was so important for people to understand that what he was writing, what he was giving was God's word. He was an apostle. He wasn't just a, a godly man. He was a godly man that God had called as, as an apostle. Uh, he, he started the, the book uh, saying, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. God had called him. God had shown that this was his, his ministry. And uh, false teachers uh, were polluting and watering down the gospel. And uh, Christians needed to know that Paul had God's authority and that his message was from God. There's plenty of people who say, I have a message from God. Uh, you know, there's, there's no lack of that. But we, we have proof when, when it goes God's way and follows God's, uh, God's pattern. Uh, some questioned Paul's abilities. Some even questioned his looks. <laughs> You're going to get that sometimes. Uh, he said his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. They didn't like the way he talked. Some, of course, questioned his sincerity. But many, uh, the main problem was they, they questioned his call of God, his apostleship. And, and in uh, chapter 10, uh, he warns about false measurements. Look at chapter 10, verse 12, just by way of review. He says, for we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. So you and I are not the standard. We're not the pattern. God is. And uh, he gave some, some things, really maybe some questions that uh, we can ask that he was answering about his own ministry, but we can apply to ourselves. You know, a good question to ask is, am I where God wants me to be? You know, Paul understood he was where God wanted him. Uh, is God glorified by my ministry? There in verse 17, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Uh, can the Lord commend my work? You know, it's not whether you commend it or somebody else says, good job. It's whether the Lord says, this is the work I've called you to. Well, in chapter 11, he continues to defend his ministry, uh, showing them uh, that his opposition to false teachers was because of his love for them. He loved the Corinthians, and he loved the truth. And, and he shows this by, uh, and this is where the, the word jealousy comes in, his jealousy over them, and his generosity to them, and his concern for them. So let's read uh, 2 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 1. Down, I'm just going to read to start with down through verse 6. Would to God that ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I'm jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I've espoused you to one husband, that I may, may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. For if he that, for if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we've not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which you've not received, or another gospel, which you've not accepted, ye might well bear with him. For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles. But though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, but we have been thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. Uh, that word rude is not like nasty. It just means uh, simple, you know, basic. Uh, godly jealousy, 
You know, true love is jealous. That's not envious, but it's jealous. It, 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 it seeks to, uh, to have a love that's, that's pure. And that's what he's saying to them. He, he makes the comparison like a, a loving father for his daughter. You know, she's a spouse to a, a godly man. And he wants her to, to, to keep that, that commitment. Uh, Paul was jealous over their relationship to Christ. He wanted them to keep that pure and keep it right. In verse 2, he said, I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy. He says, I want to present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. He wanted them to have their, uh, their church, their, their lives, uh, their beliefs in a right relationship to the Lord. And the peril is, well, I'll use the word immorality, but it's, it's spiritual adultery. Uh, James used that term in uh, James chapter 4 and, and verse 4. He said, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. See, there's that jealousy, isn't there? God says, uh, our, relation is, our relationship is exclusive. You can't, you can't have me as your God and worship something else, too. God is a jealous God. And uh, Paul was jealous over these folks, uh, their relationship to the Lord. He wanted them to love Christ. And not other things. You can see that's a, that's a common problem, isn't it? You know, for us to be drawn away. And the danger is he begins to list uh, there in uh, verses 3 and 4. Verse 3 is, is a verse we, we memorized a year or two ago. Uh, it's a verse you should, you should know or at least know where it is. He, he, he puts the, the basic problem here. I fear lest by any means, he goes right back to the beginning, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. You know, subtlety are little things. Subtle things. Are, they're not some big, you know, massive thing where, boom, you know, big change. It's a, it's a little change. And that's the way Satan gets us off, off track. Usually, you know, he works subtly. He says, oh, just, it won't make any difference. Just make this little change. Oh, just don't do that little thing. Yeah, he's very subtle. And he beguiled uh, you know, to, to beguile is, is to trick, and he does it subtly. And his, his purpose is to corrupt our minds from the simplicity that's in Christ. I'm amazed at how com complex some organizations are. You know, with what they say, oh, how you've got to follow Christ and so on. Uh, in various religions, uh, I don't have a number, but you know, the Buddhists just have hundreds and hundreds of rules you've got to keep. And people look at that as a, a simple thing just because they wear robes. Man, it's one of the most legalistic religions you could ever find. And, uh, you know, Satan works that way. He wants to beguile people. Satan always twists God's word. Let me just throw something in here. I think this is the danger of in Internet ministries. I'm not against the Internet, but you, know, you go on the Internet and you, you find a preacher and, uh, you, you know, oh, boy, he sounds good. You need to be careful. The first thing you need to look at is their statement of faith. If they don't have one, don't listen to them. <laughs> uh, the, the most, you know, c cult people, uh, the, a person can start a cult because they're persuasive, because they're a good speaker. Uh, be careful. Uh, that, that's just kind of a sideline, but Satan always twists God's word. Satan hates the simple plan of salvation. Uh, we, we used to use a tract a lot many years ago, God's simple plan of salvation. And it's true. It's very simple. It's like someone has said, hey, if you've got a sin problem, that's good. God knows how to deal with that. <laughs> a very simple solution. You, know, you repent and he'll, he'll forgive. Uh, Satan hates that. He wants to make it com com complicated and hard to say. <laughs> uh, watch out. And uh, in verse 4, he gives us some of the, the basic things that come up. Did you notice that as we read through? And Paul presents it like, you know, people are going to come and they'll present these things and you'll probably believe them. <laughs> you know, he says, he that cometh pre if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we've not preached. You, sometimes people try to make Jesus whatever they want him to be. Listen, there's only one Jesus. He's the one that was prophesied in the Old Testament. Hundreds of, I was reading this week, I think there's like 300 and something prophecies in the Old Testament over a third of them are in the book of Isaiah. That's amazing, isn't it? 
all these prophecies about Jesus, it's that one person, that one God who became flesh. It's not just anybody. You know, some people say, oh, you can just become your own Jesus. No, that's not, that's not the right Jesus. I grew up in California. There's lots of Jesuses in California. It was pronounced Jesus. You know, most of them played baseball. <laughs> uh, you know, they had the name. It didn't mean they were the Christ. Um, some people say, well, he, he was only a man. Well, that's not the Jesus of the Bible. The, the Mormons teach he was Satan's brother. Did you know that? Well, that's not the Jesus of the Bible. Uh, others say he's not God and, and so on. There's those who come and they preach another Jesus. Well, it's not Jesus. We need to be careful. We need to, uh, to stay with, with the Lord. Uh, God, God wants us to be pure in, in our beliefs. He talks about another spirit. If you receive another spirit, which you've not received. There's probably a couple of different ways you could, you could apply this. Of course, the Holy Spirit there's only one Holy Spirit. But as well, there's the spirit in which you do things. You know, some people uh, have the spirit of rebellion. I know, I'm sure, there's people who get into religion because they're rebellious. They just want to be different than everybody else. You know, they want to do something that set their mom and dad off or something. And, you know, there's people who do things because of a spirit of, of rebellion. Uh, there's people who do things because of an ecumenical spirit. You know, you know what I'm talking about with that? Just wanting to agree with everybody. Just bring everybody together and we'll just all be, we'll just love each other and be, be happy. There's what you might call a charismatic spirit. Now, that's come up in, you know, in the last century. Um, you know, the idea that we need signs and wonders. We just need things to, to, to show us. Well, that was true in, in the New Testament. But the Bible says when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part is going to pass away. Do you know why we disagree with the charismatics? Let, let me give you the reason. It's two very basic things. It's because of what they believe about salvation and what they believe about the Bible. You don't get any more basic than that. Um, they believe in salvation by works. And the reason I say that, they may not put that into words, but they'll teach that you can lose your salvation. And any group that believes you can lose your salvation, that means it's not just of the Lord, it's of something you've done. It's by works. And they believe in prophecies and visions and, and things that are different or outside of Scripture. Listen, those are the two most basic beliefs we have. Salvation, Jesus, and the Bible. Uh, a, a charismatic spirit is, is not the spirit of the Lord. Now, the spirit of God uses the word of God to make people of God. And we need to be careful that we're not deceived by a, a different spirit. And that leads us to the third point, another gospel. Or another gospel which you've not accepted. He says, you might, you might well bear with them. You might believe what, what they have to say. And, you know, God takes a very strong stand on this. Uh, a couple pages to the right in my Bible, Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. I always remember that Galatians, it starts with G, and his main subject is grace. That starts with G, too. I can remember that. And uh, they, they were getting off on things. They were getting uh, away from what God had taught about grace. In verse uh, 6, Galatians 1, 6, he says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Listen, there's only one gospel. If it's not the gospel, it's not another one. It's just not the gospel. <laughs> it's what they're presenting as, as a, a fake. And, and listen to how, how strong... A, the Bible is on this. Look at verse, uh, verse 8. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we've preached unto you, let him be accursed. Man, that's a strong statement. God is saying the gospel, you know, salvation, it's really important we get it right. And one of the reasons you know it's so important is he repeats it. Verse 9. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. And the reason God and Paul and the Bible take such a strong stand on this is when, when you have the wrong gospel, it makes Christ's death unnecessary and useless and foolish. It makes a mockery of, of the cross. Uh, that's what he says in, in Hebrews uh, chapter 10, verse 28. 
He says, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. So the Old Testament, there was, there was a punishment for getting outside of God's standard. Of how much sorer punishment, how much worse punishment, suppose ye shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. Then he says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Can you imagine someone who thought they'd accepted the gospel? And they stand before God and they find out it's not the gospel at all. What a terrible thing. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Uh, Paul is saying, uh, there needs to be a godly jealousy for our church, for, for what's right. Uh, you know... Uh, Salesmen and con men use your politeness to trick you. <laughs> yeah, you, you have had it happen. You walk along in the shopping center. Oh, excuse me, can I talk to you a minute? And boy, you feel so bad when you say no. <laughs> and, and it's the same with the cults. You know, they're, they're fun and they do this and that. And listen, we're not to listen to those that are, are not following God's word. Uh, we need to be careful. Uh, this is, this is a... A very dangerous thing. God says he's, he's jealous for us. He wants us to stay true to him. And he goes on later in, in verse 13. He talks about false ministers. That's what he's bringing it all up to. Uh, he says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, tra transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. He says there's those who are just, they're just false teachers. And, uh, you know, God takes, uh, takes a very dim view of, uh, of this. Folks that are, are teaching, uh, twisting God's word. Because, you see, that's the way Satan wants. And these are people who've been deceived themselves. And uh, they're just trying to get you away from what, from what God has said. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and, and verse um, verse 1, he talks about Israel, and he says, there were false prophets among the people, even as there should be false teachers among you. Listen to what he says, who privily or privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. There's going to be false teachers. Uh, we need to stay true to God's word. And you know, As a pastor, it, it's such a a challenge, you know, keeping true to God's word, keeping our church, you know, on, on point and, and staying with the, uh, the basics and the, and the simplicity that, that's in Christ. In uh, 2 Peter 2 there, he, he says, if God spared not the angels that sinned, verse 5, it spared not the old world. You know, that's when the flood came. In verse 6, turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes. You know, God judges when we get away from him and from his word, we... We face the judgment of God. In verse 9, he says, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust under the day of judgment to be punished. Yeah, God, will, God will sort it all out. We need to make sure that we're listening to what God has to say. It's not enough to be happy in whatever group you're in. You need to be happy in the Lord. You need to be happy in, in God's word. You know, our response, he gives to us is in 2 John there. 2 John has only one chapter, verse 9. He says, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. The doctrine of Christ is what the Bible teaches us is who Jesus is, who the Christ is. Then he says, If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, Receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. You know, when people come to your door, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses come, uh, you, know, you can be nice to them, but don't invite them in. Don't say, God bless you. They're doing the work of the devil. They're, they're, it's like they're at the door of heaven pointing them to hell. I mean, that's not good, and they're lost themselves. The time to witness to them is probably not usually at the door. But you could... If you know a Jehovah's Witness, listen, they're lost folks. They, they need to know the Lord. Same with the Mormons and, and the Muslims and, and so on. Uh, false ministers. Listen, God is jealous. 
because he loves us. And uh, we need to be true to him. We have a pamphlet that we make available, How to Detect a False Religion. You can apply it to How to Detect a False Teacher. It basically says, do they teach any person other than Jesus Christ? That's one of them. Second was, do they teach any book other than the Bible? You know, there's lots of religions with lots of different saviors and people that they teach and other books that they, that they use. Do they teach any salvation other than the gospel of Jesus Christ? You know, we, we read there in, in Galatians, Paul said, though we, you know, he said, if, if I were to teach you a different gospel, he said, don't believe it. Or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you. Isn't it amazing how often these false religions have an angel involved? You stop and think about it. Uh, Catholics, man, they got lots of angels. Uh, Mormons, they put an angel on top of their buildings. That's, that's where they claim they started. Muslims, uh, lots of them. Uh, there's lots of people who say, oh, an angel came and stood at the foot of my bed and said this or said that. Uh, Listen, God says, get back to the simplicity that's in Christ. Don't, don't go by how you feel or what you think. Can you see why Paul is so concerned? You know, the same pressures we face today, they faced then. They lived in a heathen society. And, uh, you know, there was, uh, there was those who were false teachers, false prophets. Uh, he wanted them to stay true to Christ. And he showed his love for them and, and that he wanted the best for them. He wanted them to know Christ. The second area is he, he showed his love to them by his generosity to them. It's a kind of a little different subject. Maybe I should have quit, quit, quit there, but, but we're going to go on. It's really interesting, I, I think, this next part. Let's read starting in verse 7. This has to do a little bit with money. Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that ye might be exalted because I've preached to you the gospel of God freely? I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man. For that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. And in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of, of Achaia. Wherefore? Because I love you not? God knoweth. But what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. Now, that last verse is, is kind of hard to understand, but what he's saying is these false teachers, people were saying, well, Paul must not really be an apostle or he'd accept money. You know, we offer to help him and he, he turns us down. And he's saying, these false teachers, boy, they'd love to have money. <laughs> And that's one of the things they work for. He says, I wish they were, would be like me and turn down the money. You know, he's saying to them, uh, have I committed an offense against you and that I didn't let you support me financially? Isn't that a, a strange thing? Uh, Paul was very generous to them and very opposite to the false teachers. God warns us several times in the New Testament that false teachers are after our money. <laughs> I mean, that, that's, you just mark it down. False teachers aren't there to give. They're there to get. And they'll have, uh, they have plenty of ways that they, they go about it. We read there in 2 Peter, uh, one of the verses, verse 3, he says, talking about false teachers, through covetousness shall they with feigned works make merchandise of you. Remember that phrase. See, that's what false teachers, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to make merchandise of you. You're just dollars and cents to them. Later on, uh, in verse 14 of 2 Peter 2, he says, again, describing false teachers, having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, and heart they have exercised with covetous practices. <laughs> you go back to some of these major false religions, and, and you'll find immorality. Uh, you know, I'm sorry to be specific, but uh, you know, the Mormons and the Muslims particularly come to mind. Uh, perversion and ungodliness, but especially, man, they're organized financially. And uh, you, I don't know if you know it, the Mormons own most of Las Vegas. They don't believe in drinking and gambling, but boy, they'll sure take the money from it. Uh, Paul was not like that. What he's, he's saying to them is, don't 
don't be offended because I won't take your support. You know, don't be offended because I, I, I don't let you pay me. He could have expected financial support. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he, he talked about that. You know, it's just a, a principle of life. Uh, 1 Corinthians 9 verse 11 he says, if we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things, you know, the physical? If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we, rather? Nevertheless, we've not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Uh, verse 14, he says, even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should, should live of the gospel. Yeah, he could have asked them to, help him financially, but he particularly chose not to because he felt like it could be a hindrance uh, to the ministry. Verse 18 of, of 1 Corinthians 9, he says, What is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. Paul had a unique position. He was an apostle. I'm not an apostle. We don't have apostles today. Uh, they were only people who had been under the ministry of Christ. And they were, they were a very unique group of people uh, that, that God used basically to give us the scriptures and, and uh, to get things going in the New Testament. Uh, Paul could have expected financial support, but he chose not to. It, it's kind of funny in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 13, I'm pretty sure this verse is sarcasm. Uh, it, it's pretty hard to tell. You know, they didn't have, what are those called, emojis? They didn't have emojis in those days where they could let you know this is sarcasm. But um, he, he basically apologizes for not accepting their money. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 13. For what is it wherein you were inferior to other churches, except it be that I myself was not burdensome to you? Forgive me this wrong. <laughs> Will you please forgive me for not letting you pay me, you know, giving me money. <laughs> and now that, to me, that's got to be sarcasm. Uh, but he's so generous to them. He didn't want what they had. He wanted them. He wanted them to know the Lord. He loved them. He loved them uh, by protecting them from spiritual unfaithfulness. Uh, he loved them by being generous to them. He also loved them by his concern for them. Uh, we're going to read starting in verse 23 there of 2 Corinthians 11. The things he was willing to go through uh, because of his love uh, for the Corinthians and, and other, other people. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11. I'll just start in verse 23. And he's, he starts off comparing himself to these false teachers. He says, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. He says, I'm going to talk like them for a little while here. I am more. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, above measure. In prisons, more frequent. In deaths, oft. Of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. Now, the Jews had a law. You could only give a, a prisoner 40, 40 whip, whips. And so what they would do is they would give 39 just in case they'd miscounted. He had that happen to him five times. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep. In journeyings often. In perils of water. In perils of robbers. In perils by my own countrymen. In perils by the heathen. In perils in the city. In perils in the wilderness in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Man, all the things that he went through physically, outwardly, uh, just to be there and to share the gospel, just to make those trips and, and to spend that time uh, taking the gospel to people. But I think it all comes down to verse 28 when he says, Besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. You know, more than just the external. Everything else was external, but his love for them was internal and constant. Uh, Paul loved them, and, and, and he fought for their spiritual lives. He was willing to suffer whatever it took uh, to minister to them. And you know, as you, as you think about some of these uh, concepts tonight, you know, we're not apostles, and uh, we don't have to defend our apostleship. We need to understand Paul was an apostle. What he wrote and what he did was had God's authority, and uh, it's God's word. You know, he loved those people with, with such a love. And it made me think, we need to be careful. We don't take the love of others for granted. You know, here they, these people were giving him, some of them were giving him a hard time. And all he'd been through for them. Uh, 
And, uh, you know, in, in life, there's lots of things going to happen. But keep your eye on the, on the main things. You know, don't, don't be fooled, like he says there in, in verse 3. Uh, be careful what you emphasize. You know, in relationships, in, in the things that are going on in life, uh, just in the physical, uh, you know, just in the, in the secular, be careful what you emphasize, but as well in the, in the spiritual. You know, you can get off onto things, and, and sometimes they're not necessarily bad things, but it'll take you away from the simplicity that's in Christ. It'll take you away from the main things. Uh, I, I know people who, all they talk about is prophecy. Prophecy is a good thing, but it's not the only thing. Uh, prophecy is there to show us Jesus. Don't forget the main point. Uh, I know people who are into Jewish things. You know, they, they love to go back and look at the sacrifices and the feasts and you know, all those things. And uh, those, are, those are good. They're the shadow of things to come. But listen, we have the reality now. There's a reason there's a New Testament. <laughs> you read Hebrews. Uh, it's better. The New Testament is better than the Old Testament. God's words, not mine. Uh, you know, you can get off on, on things. Conspiracy theories, you know, looking at this and that. and uh, Dangerous ground here, but even the King James Version. You, you can make that such an issue that you forget. I've known people who believed in the King James Version, but didn't do what it said. And that's not the point. Uh, we, we need the King James Bible, but we need to do what it says. It, it's all about relationships and our key relationship in life is the Lord Jesus. Satan, look at verse 3. He says, 2 Corinthians eleven three. 3, I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve. Listen, Satan will use any means he can to deceive you. And sometimes the most unexpected things. It will get your eyes off the Lord. You know, it can be your health. It can be your, your work. It can be school. It can be a relationship. You can go on and on and on. Satan's, he's not dumb. He's clever. He's deceitful and, and smart. And he, by any means, I, I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. We need to be careful. Let, let me close to, tonight with a couple of verses from, from Titus. Titus chapter 2. I, I think this is a kind of a quick definition of godliness. If we're going to follow the Lord, we need to be godly people. Titus 2, verse 11. I'll just read uh, three verses here. Titus 2, 11, he says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope, and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And right there is a three-point sermon. Uh, the first is leave. There's things we need to leave to be godly. Denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. There's things we need to live. He says we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And there's a place we need to look. There's a person we need to look to. Looking for that blessed hope. For the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. To me, that, that's just a simple definition of godliness. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who do the opposite. They leave godliness, they live for worldly lusts, and they look for excuses. Now, that's not the way we want to be. We want to look to Jesus, who alone can save. Uh, you know, that, that verse, I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. Uh, don't be beguiled. Don't be corrupted. Don't be turned aside. Stay with the simplicity in Christ. Uh, I think we need to make that a commitment. I'm going to stay with the simplicity that's in Christ. Uh, Satan wants to deceive us. Uh, Christ can, can lead us and guide us. We're going to close this evening with the song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. I thought that would be a, a good way to, to end this. Page 160 in your songbook there. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. And as we sing, uh, let's make that commitment to to for sure do that in this present world right now uh, to do it. Azrael, you want to come and, and lead us in that?